bit of paranoia. Welcome to the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. Welcome to tonight's episode of the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. I'm your host, Nate, and I'm joined by one of our usual co-hosts, Dustin. Say hi, Dustin. Hello, everybody. Dustin, 66, alive and well. Dustin has not been on the show in so long that his camera doesn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, it gave up on me. I didn't give up on the show, though. It may have given up on me, but I haven't given up on you. So, uh, tonight we have a special guest with us. Uh, we've got Jason Blanchard. Um, hey. let, me, let me see if I can get this title right. Uh, I wrote it down okay. here somewhere. Um, Content and Community Director at Black Hills Information Security. Correct. Yep. So, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much welcome. for having me. <laughs> so, uh, you want to give us a little bit of background about who you are and whatever, and then we'll talk about why you're here? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, one of the main reasons I'm here is because we met at DerbyCon. Um, That's so, a great reason. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, if anyone was at the last DerbyCon, I was the opening keynote speaker. At least that's the way I remember it. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I mean, you were there opening night. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh-huh. yeah. I, I performed stand up comedy at the opening. And uh, like one of the first things I said, I was like, wow, thank you, Dave, for inviting me to be the you know, keynote speaker at the final DerbyCon. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's how that works. <laughs> that's not what it is. No, that's not it. <laughs> uh, so my background is uh, comic books and filmmaking. I joined information security about five years ago when I went to work for SANS. I was a SANS marketing manager for like four years um, for the pen test curriculum. So anything that had to do with like a pen test course at SANS, I was uh, a part of that. So I made a lot of posters. So if you have any like SANS posters hanging up in your office right now, if you don't, you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go to sands.com slash posters or something. Jason, um, did you also create the posters that were like the fourfold posters? Like uh, the breakdown of email spam, things like that, that came with the uh, quarterly publications or whatever they were? Yeah, I did the, the pen test one. So I did the blueprint poster. Okay, yep. I did the whiteboard poster. So if you have, Oh, cool. Yeah, it's like the whiteboard with all the different yeah. commands on it. Yep. Yep. And then my last one was the pivots and payloads poster, which was... Uh, it's like a, not Kenny Lane, shoots and ladders version of doing a pen test. Mm, I don't know if I have that one. Yeah. It's uh, interesting. Yeah. Indeed. I created that one because I didn't understand pen testing when I first, you know, got into information security. And so since I didn't understand it, like people had to explain it over the years. I was like, oh, I get it now. Um, but I, I like created the thing because I wish I would have had it. And so it takes you through, you know, the reconnaissance phase all the way through, you know, pivot and escalation all the way through, you know, post-exploitation to reporting. That so is helps. that is always a great reason, in my opinion, to make a thing. Yeah. Just, yeah. To, yeah. you know, something something that um, you needed <laughs> and did not have, <laughs> yeah. wished you had. Yeah. Uh, so then you make one so that someone else can uh, can have it. So that's yeah. that's great. That's um, as as we were chatting before Dustin joined, when, when you and I were, were were chatting earlier, that's why I made this show, <laughs> because uh, I couldn't find an ops focused podcast, so I made one, and now there's more out there. So you know, uh, they're all they all followed us. That's what it is. It's we're not it's not because I couldn't we did it find before them. they were cool. Yeah, it's it's yeah. not because I didn't see them or didn't look hard enough. It's because they followed us. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're going to talk about this card game here in a second. Uh, but as soon as we created this card game, uh, everyone that had a card game started telling me about it. And I was like, oh, there's like a ton of card games out there. For yeah, right. Why didn't we know this? <laughs> it's like, I had no idea these existed. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, so that, that brings us to why uh, we asked you or Black Hills in general to be on the show. And that's because of this cool thing you guys were giving out at DerbyCon. And th- was this the first time you guys had given these away? This is when you released these? Yeah, so it showed up like two days before DerbyCon. Like, oh. sent out to a printer, uh, had them printed, had never seen them. We had only seen like a digital proof of it. And we're yeah. like, yeah, it's great. Let's, let's hope yeah. they're awesome. <laughs> yeah. So we have and a then, first printing of these things. See that, Dustin? Yeah. We've wow, got that's awesome. First printing. Yeah. It should have kept them in the wrapper. I know, dang it. <laughs> yeah, you guys have the ones with the two typos in it. But yeah, it's fine. Ah, oh, challenge. Good. Find the typos. Now find the typos. Yeah. That's cool. Thank you. Now it's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> right now, I'm gonna go through every single card and find the typos. Or is it on the box? Let's look. No. Yeah. Okay. So the thing we're talking about is this card game called Backdoors and Breaches. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I had only heard about this shortly before DerbyCon because I think that's because you guys were hyping it up a little bit, hoping that 
you'd have them for DerbyCon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> but I I have heard about another thing you guys created. What was it? Cubicles and compromises, which was like I don't know a year ago or something. Yeah. So about a year before I showed up at Black Hills, uh, John and the team, John's the owner, had yeah. come up with a uh, incident response meets Dungeons and Dragons. Right. And they called it cubicles and compromises, and they put out a, uh, they created a special die for it, you know, to, to give away. So mm -hmm. yeah, D twenty. Yep. Um, they came up with a couple scenarios, and they did a couple webcasts on like, here's how to play, here's how to do it. Yeah. And and really, when I showed up at Black Hills, I saw this thing called cubicles and compromises. I was like, this looks amazing. Yeah. Um, and I was like, this is really cool. Like, there's people playing it. There's already like an infrastructure for it. Uh, and so when we looked into it, what we realized is that it it didn't catch on as well as it could because people didn't have an imagination. Yeah. So like, when I when I first heard of it, I thought, oh, that's just like this funny thing Black Hills is doing. And then I started hearing more people talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I think I watched one of the webcasts where the folks at Black Hills were playing it. I thought, that's really cool. Yeah. But as a Dungeons & Dragons player myself, um, I know there's a really big difference between being a player and being yeah. a Dungeon Master. Yeah. Dungeon Master has a lot of work to do. They have to think yeah. of a lot of things. They have to make sure it's in, it's engaging for the the players and all that. I'm not a good Dungeon Master. <laughs> I'm a fine player. I don't think I would qualify yeah. as one either. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I watched the... Uh, I guess you guys had a, another webcast. I don't even know when it was released, but I, I watched it just earlier, to, or rewatched it earlier today to refresh my memory for tonight's podcast, mm -hmm. um, where John played a game. It was John and CJ, I think, played a game, yeah. and they they gave some of the backstory about cubicles and compromises and how you know the lack of imagination was really a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, <laughs> I totally get that. But it was still a really cool idea. How how fleshed out was the rule set for that? Like, did they go uh, crazy? Not with very. It? No. No, not very. Uh, it was pretty loose and it was pretty like, hey, here's this concept, this thing that we came up with. And if you want to run with it, go ahead and yeah. you can customize it and everything. And some people did. Um, like as I was at more conferences talking about backdoors and breaches, you know, people would come up like, oh, I play cubicles and compromises. Like, oh, cool. Cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, and then a guy named right. Ian, uh, he's a B-Sides organizer for Orlando did this amazing like cubicles and compromises he's got a rule book he's got fleshed out he's got a spinning wheel of like engagement wow. and injects and all this stuff and um so he's taking that around to different conferences and now and, and teaching cool. people how to play that so that's, that's cool awesome. so that's that's still alive and well in other words it's not something that that the, the people have forgotten about because they have the card game now uh, I think maybe over time it will be forgotten about now that the card game will help improve uh, on it. But I think, you know, there's still going to be people out there like, oh, yeah, cool. Cubicles and compromise. Yeah. That's so. neat. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I when I first heard about it, I just thought that was a, that was a great idea. It, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a great way because I've, I've been through one or two tabletop uh, exercises uh, for disaster recovery, not for an infosec incident like... Mm -hmm. like uh, Backdoors and breaches is meant to simulate, um, and they are a little dry, and they're not very random, and they're very predictable because it, it all depends on who's thinking up the disaster scenario. Yeah. Um, so cubicles and compromises, I thought, oh, that's cool. Put a rule set around it. But then that brings us to backdoors and breaches. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about what this thing is that we've been talking about, and yeah, sure. Why it's different? Yeah. Uh so John and I, we were trying to figure out how to do cubicles and compromises better. Uh, and I was in a comic book store and I was looking around to see if I could find anything for inspiration. And I found that um, Dungeons and Dragons make cards. Mm -hmm. and the cards were there to assist the dungeon master and like, here's you know, magic items or here's this or here's monsters. And I was like, oh, the cards, like that would help people with their imagination or spur ideas or, or that. So I was on the phone with John. I was like, what if we did cards? And he's like, yeah, cards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then like nothing happened for like three weeks. And then three weeks later, I get a call and he's like, I figured it out. And I was like, oh, what happened? I've got cards here. Uh, he's like, I was laying on the floor in a, a <laughs> Miami airport. <laughs> All right. And he's like, and I heard this family just arguing through playing Uno. Uh, okay <laughs> and he's like and, and it came to me and i was like all right uh and so essentially what it is it's like you have a the dungeon master has attack cards and so i can go through those 
so uh, in every deck of backdoors and breaches, there's 52 cards that make up the deck. And so you have the um, um, backdoors and breaches, I'm sorry, the initial compromise, which are the red cards. You have the pivot and escalate cards, which are the yellow cards. And and what these are, if like, you know, if you're a sysadmin or something, or if you're not sure what these things are, this is how the attacker originally gets it. So it's the initial compromise. It's the very first step that they took to, to start to compromise your organization. Pivot and escalate means that once they've gotten in, they're like, well, how do we move laterally? How do we go from this system to a different system? And so those are the techniques there. And then you have persistence. So it's an attack card that this is the way the attackers maintain staying in the network. And so they might uh, infect this one computer, but now they're moving laterally or they're moving throughout the organization and they're leaving malware behind in different systems so that way they can come back. So if you cut off their initial compromise, they can still have their way in. Uh, and then the last attack card is the C2 and Xfil. So this is how the attackers are communicating with their malware or how, they, how they're maintaining or exfiltrating data in a way that you can't just generally detect. And so those are the four different attack cards. And so the, the incident master, the, you know, so the dungeon master of the incident master, uh, what they do to build out the incident is they take one red, one yellow, one purple, and one brown card. Uh, and that's what builds out their incident. And so they sit back and they keep these cards, you know, to themselves. And I'm going to show you, but it's a web server compromise. It's uh, that's the initial compromise was a web server. That never they use, happens. Yeah, they use a broadcast multicast uh, protocol poisoning to pivot and escalate to the network. Uh, they're using a malicious driver to maintain persistence, and they're using DNS as C2. Never wow. DNS. Never yeah. DNS. No. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so the, the incident master holds these and then you know takes these and builds the incident out with it. So the defenders or the incident responders, uh, they would just take these four cards and go, all right, so looking at this, it was Tuesday afternoon. Uh, and so they start to do the incident with the team. And uh, any questions so far? So I... One just just with the the level of technical detail that appears yeah. to be on those cards, uh, was there a lot of thought given to like the audience? Like, well, no, like like an actual logical progression of like hmm. this kind of a compromise couldn't possibly lead to this lead to this kind of pivot. Right, uh, that was one of the considerations. So when we did some beta testing and some initial gameplay. Uh, there was, you know, you pull these cards and you're like, ah, that may never be able to happen. Right. And so we did do beta testing over the summer uh, to give us a feel for like, is this even possible? Right. Uh, and so there were some uh, changes that took place uh, during the beta testing. But generally, uh, there is 3,840 different possibilities with the different cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all, for the most part, like ninety five percent or so can be a thing that can really happen. Right. How how many combinations did you say? Thirty eight hundred and forty. Oh man. Yeah. Nice. I mean, I I guess there has to be a certain level of this is just a game. Yeah. You, sure. You, even if that doesn't sound like it makes sense, just roll with it. <laughs> Literally roll with it. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is too is like you said, there's a lot of technical knowledge here, and, and so we wanted these cards to be. Uh, a teaching tool. So if you look at the cards, and I don't know how close you can see this, but down at the bottom, there's links or there's tools or there's something nice. to go along with the attacks that say, you know, if you don't know what this is, well, here's a tool that can help you with that. Or here's a blog post that will help explain this in a better way for you in case you don't know what that is. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, and the only thing helpful. you have to worry about is when those blog posts get taken down by the people who wrote them or... Or the, or the project <laughs> later. The project is gone, yeah. yeah. We'll go to the internet way, way back machine for our... Yeah, right, pages. right. We're all depending on, uh, on the, the internet archive now. Well, uh, <laughs> to try to get around that, all the blogs go back to ours. Oh, perfect. perfect. So you can never call your own blogs. Nice. That's good. You've got control <laughs> yeah. over those. Thought ahead of that. <laughs> yeah. There are some GitHubs that, you know, someone might be like, well, I don't feel like you know, maintaining that anymore. But yeah, you know, for the most part, right. all uh, education, it's things that we've written over the years. So. 
cool cool yeah right. so um i don't know we didn't really go into a lot of detail as to what the heck an incident response uh tabletop exercise really is yeah. i mean I'm, I'm kind of making an assumption that many people already have an idea True. what that is but maybe maybe they don't i don't know so if we got any listeners who flat out don't know what that is uh you're basically making up a situation and getting your team together whether that's you know your your coworkers or your infosec team or you know whatever uh, together to try to game out how it is that you're going to deal with a situation. Uh, the ones I've been through have been like, oh well, we have this ERP that has all of our important employee data in it. What happens if it just breaks? Like, like what if the Oracle database goes away or something? What do we do? Right? Oh well, we have backups. Well, how long will that take to restore? Um, what if the data center that the backups were in got hit by a meteor? You know, like whatever. You, you yeah. try to game yeah. out these RPOs, situations. RPOs. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, backdoors and breaches is basically from an infosec perspective, right? That's really what it's, yeah. what it's meant to be. It's not, it, this is meant to be your mail server got compromised through, you know, this thing that, you know, was a bug that you knew about, but you didn't patch <laughs> or whatever. And, yeah. uh, these, these are the things that have already occurred. You don't know about them yet. You're now in a situation where you're like, I see a breach. What happens next? Right. Yeah. So like some of the uh, the initial compromises, we have uh, fish credential stuffing inside our threat. You know, it's a fun scenario where Ooh, it's, right. uh, it's a disgruntled employee. Does that get like handed to somebody that's already <laughs> actually responding to the... <laughs> like what if Nate's the insider threat and he's also on the response team? That'd be a cool angle. <laughs> he's in there. Sewing this information. <laughs> yeah, someone uh, asked us if we do an expansion pack that was all inside the threat. Yeah. Uh, where the awesome. person on the incident response team was like actively working against the incident. Man, this guy's really quick. Every time we decide on something, <laughs> it's like it's already there's taken a, past our point of plan. There's a yeah. card game like that, isn't there? What was it called? Um, it's got something to do with like the mole or something. I forget what the name of the. Card game, but one of the one of the players is the mole, mm -hmm. and then everyone else has to try to like figure out who the mole is. And the mole, of course, is trying to spread lies to <laughs> throw everybody is that off. Like the the Hitler okay. game or something that kitten. Secret Hitler. Released. It's Secret Hitler. It's That's called Secret it Hitler. Oh. Secret Hit. Nice. Yeah, I know. Great name, right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome name. Uh, this one is fun. It's a trusted relationship. So it's, <laughs> uh, and, and really, you know, where these cards came from, where these you know ideas came from, is the things that we encounter all the times uh, a company that deals with penetration testing and security anal uh, analyst analyzing that doesn't sound right Consu Consurity consulting <laughs> uh, we have the social engineering card uh, there's two links at the bottom feel free to click on those if you want to you know if you go to them it's a phone to a goat YouTube's, and a dream of evil okay. people trusting yeah. people yeah, yeah uh, password right. sprays you know what's cool is that uh, sometimes when we've seen people and you know if you're listening right now and you don't know what a password spray is is that even in information security someone may go well, and, and that is again and so you're like oh cool so all right teach so it's like a teachable nice. thing that's good yeah. that's good all the teachable moments of life yeah all right uh so the other part about it is like you were saying you know incident response or coming up with a, a scenario is that what if the oracle database breaks or what if this happens or what if that happens and so what we we have is uh, the uh, incident handlers or the responders get the blue cards. So if you have a deck of these, you get the blue cards. And these are the different types of procedures that you would use to try to solve the incident. Uh, so we have like endpoint security protection analysis, server analysis, internal segmentation, user and entity behavioral analytics. That was a fun one. Uh, the reason why this one is fun, I was listening to a podcast, uh, Darknet Diaries. Mm-hmm listen to them and there was a pen tester talking about um he was an internal insider threat doing an internal pen test like he was hired at the company to pretend to be someone in marketing to see how far he could get through. oh yeah yeah i heard this episode yeah it was, it was called like joe and marketing or something was the name of the episode uh, yeah, jeremy and marketing jeremy that's what it was yeah yeah uh and so he finally gets to a point where he compromises someone's system and like tries to launch an exploit and he was caught within 10 minutes yeah wow uh, and the reason yeah, because why he ran PowerShell from like yep. some 
HR or marketing persons or something machine, and they're like, why are they running PowerShell? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so user and FTD behavior analytics is that procedure. You know, right. You, you know, is there someone currently doing something that they wouldn't be That's doing abnormal. because they've never done that? So, right, right. Uh, seam log analysis, endpoint analysis, firewall log review, crisis. So crisis management is when you get HR, uh, you get uh, management involved, you get legal involved uh, in case you... Um, uh, in case it keeps escalating. Right. Uh, uh, threat analytics. I don't know if you can see these when I put them up to the camera or not. I, I can see them well enough. I don't know if people yeah, who watch this all. later will be able to read them well, yeah. but. Uh, yeah. And then, so what we, what, what we're encouraging people to do is that if you have this written in your organization, yeah, then you can use that card. Okay. Uh, I was just going to ask, are those given to you at random and this is just a game? Or is this really like, I have a sim and I do things with my sim and because I have a sim, now I get the card? It, so we're uh, we're leaving it up to the Incident Master. Yeah. So the Incident Master could pick five cards at random if they wanted to and say, here's your written procedures and you get a plus three modifier for all dice rolls for your written procedures. Right. Or you can go through and see if you have these. And for every one that you have, you can then put those down and you get the, the modifiers for the ones that you have. Hmm. Uh, what we've heard from organizations already playing is that they look at these and go, we should probably have that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so they're like, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I feel like we should work on that. Yeah, so. I've, I've been at places where they certainly had the technology and maybe even the expertise, but they didn't have a written policy. Yeah. Right? So, you know, I'm just thinking about, like, how that would how that would work with the game. And, again, I guess that would depend on the person running the incident, right? If they're going to give it to yeah. you, then they'll give it to you. If not, then not. Yeah. So. Yeah, the, it, there's even, like, fluctuations. You know, we say you get a plus three modifier for dice rolls for yeah. written procedures. But if you have someone on your team that's, like, a – a network threat analytics like superstar and yeah. that's just what they do you could give that card like a plus six modifier if you wanted to for dice rolls because right. you know that you're going to be successful good. Yeah. yeah yeah they know their stuff sure yeah uh, and then the last cards to uh, talk about is the inject cards so these come in play uh two ways so either the incident handlers roll a one or a 20 so if they roll a one or a 20 um first you know, a one is a, a failure. Uh, one Critical through ten failure, failures. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then 11 through 20s are successful. But if you roll a 20, then an inject card comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you have three failed rolls in, in a row. Uh, we've okay. seen people just, they just keep rolling real bad and everything's mm -hmm. terrible. And, and you probably don't even know why we're rolling right now because I haven't explained that part. Right. Um, <laughs> but the inject cards come in to play. And, and our favorite one here is yeah, hopefully you can see this, but if you can't, legal takes your only skilled handler into a, a meeting to, <laughs> to discuss the incident. <laughs> I, I was I was looking through the card deck earlier, and there were a couple in here that I just I chuckled at. Let me see if I can find them again. But it was like, where was it? There's the one about legal taking your. Oh, mm -hmm. Bobby the intern kills the system you're reviewing. Yeah. Murder is that, not okay. And it even says, this happens far too often. And when I read it, I'm like, yeah, I could see that happening. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, it was misbehaving. I turned it off. Well, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I John, reformatted it. Lead handler, lead handler has a baby and takes an FMLA leave. Yep. Um, so what happens when uh, the legal takes uh, your only skilled handler or the lead handler has a baby? Yeah. So the reason why we created this card is because let's say you're doing a tabletop exercise and you have that one person out of four people that is talking the whole time. Yeah. It's like, well, I would do this or next thing I would do is this. Or, and, and, you know, we always do this. And there's like this person who's just sucking up all the air in the room. Yeah. Uh, well, then you can take this card and say, for the remainder of the incident, you're going to remain silent. Oh, it's a power card. Now, yeah. they, they may be the most skilled person in the room, too. Right. Yeah. They might. Absolutely. They might not just be a blustery know-it-all. Right. I say that because I, I, I was probably that guy in the room. Yeah. <laughs> like whenever, we, 
<laughs> Whenever we're doing light live uh, demonstrations, we always say, now raise your hand if you are that person. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, but, but I mean, you know, sometimes that's like legitimate experience. You know, yeah. I've I've seen a lot in 20 years being a sysadmin, so there's not a whole lot that surprises me. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of the people on my team, while they might have experience, they might not have the experience I do, right? So, right. Yeah, um, and we're hoping to you could just go be ahead, a know-it-all. You could just be a know-it-all, you know, that's... Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was neat, yeah. <laughs> we're hoping one or two things happen, or both things happen. One is while that person's, you know, quiet, yeah. they... The, they hear the knowledge that the rest of the team has. Right. And they can be like, oh, oh, nice. I don't have to be a know-it-all. Yeah. Yeah. Or they hear dead silence and it's just crickets and no yeah. one knows what to do next. And then, and then, you then know, that, you yeah. know, who needs to be trained? Yeah. Yeah. So it, we're not just putting it in there to, to shut that person up. We're putting it in there to hopefully. Yeah. Uh, Start a them. conversation maybe. Yeah. Uh, but we do have this like seam analyst returns from Splunk training. It's plus two modifiers for all seam related activities. It, it, it is the, if you do have people on your team that are well-trained that have certain you know, skills and abilities, give them, you know, different modifiers for dice rolls. Yeah. Now do the injects have like a positive versus negative or are they just injects or injects? Injects or injects. Uh, there, there are some like this plus two for Splunk training uh, that can, you know, help you in the yeah. game. There's one in here that's, uh, the most evil card we have is data uploaded to Pastebin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, data exfiltration. Yeah. So when that card is played, then you it's time to break out your uh, your crisis management card. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, for the people who are currently listening, uh, what would happen if your data got uploaded to Pastebin? What is that's what do you think? Yeah. That is a really good question. And that's a question that a lot of IT teams might not have an answer to. Uh, or might not even have a policy written for. I can say that um, we did not have a policy for that at my last job. Not surprising, since we also didn't have an infosec team. But <laughs> so you don't need one. You don't have a but, team, right? So I mean, what it. what that what we would do is we would involve legal and say, "Uh oh, <laughs> this thing happened. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, do we all What's have to find been? new jobs?" <laughs> yeah, right. What's pace been? Um, <laughs> But yeah, there's no written procedures, so yeah, I can understand how that's that's in there intentionally to make you think about that thing. Yeah, which is exactly and, and, what this is all about. And we do hope, like, if that card gets played, and a lot of times what happens is, you know, the person rolls a one or a twenty, and we hand the cards, you know, face down and say, you know, pick, pick. one. Yeah. And when they pull, they're like, oh, data uploaded to Pastebin, and so that just changes the game from that point. Like the yeah. incident. You're like, oh, we're still trying to solve this incident, but now we have this, it is escalated. Right. And so now what do we do? So at that point, does the game sort of go off into two threads where there's a group of people trying to solve the paste bin thing and another group of people trying to solve the breach? Uh, it could be up to the incident master that says, yeah. hey, uh, or the person on the team says, I, I'm the leader right now. You two take care of this data uploaded to paste bin thing. You all take care of this. So. I guess that makes sense because that is the sort of thing that would have to happen in a real incident. Somebody would have to take charge and they'd have to say, okay, you guys go deal with that. We'll deal with this. Yeah. yeah. And really, um, you know, one of the things while we came up with the game is because uh, what we heard from the, the community, the, the industry is that when they come up with tabletop exercises, it might take like five or six, seven, eight hours to come up with their scenarios, to come up with, you know, yeah. stories, to come up with this. And we're like, yeah, but, you should be playing more often. You should be doing this, you know, uh, quicker. Uh, and when it's than... that kind of a time sink, I can understand why they wouldn't. Yeah, I so, can say that the the ones that I've been involved with involved in they were intended to be every six months, and we mm -hmm. got we got two in in the span of like three years, <laughs> yeah. because they're a lot of work, and it takes yeah. all these people that are busy doing projects and whatever, and takes them away for a day, yeah. you know, while we're in a room gaming through a fictitious situation, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, anything that can speed that process up should be a benefit. Yeah, so what we've learned is uh, from people playing, you know, because we started getting out of DerbyCon and some other events, is that they, they're they doing this, like, weekly during lunch. Yeah. Where, where they just play That's a hand. Perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. All right. Uh, so, uh, I've been talking a lot. Yeah. We have the, the four cards for the Incident Master. Mm -hmm. They come up with a scenario. You have the defenders have the blue cards to use those to try to come up with how to solve it. And then where the dice roll comes in is 
every time the incident responders or the defenders or the you know, the team want to do anything, they have to roll the dice. Uh, so like in a scenario where you say, you know, someone got uh, an email that looked like a fish. And uh, so now they're escalating up to the, the security team. What do we do? And someone on the team says, uh, I want to see the email. I'm like, cool, roll the dice. And so they, they take the die, ah. roll it, and they're like, oh, 18, 18. Uh, so I just rolled an 18. And then the incident master says, okay, so you were able to get the, the email, and so now you have it. It's like, cool. Uh, hmm. It could have gone the other way. I rolled a three. Yeah. And now the, the person is like, well, you can't get the email because they that person logged out and went home for the day. Yeah. <laughs> and that's... So that is realistic, you know. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Can I get the email with full headers? Well, I copy in or I took a screenshot of it and I pasted it into Word and I sent and it I into the it. help desk oh, ticket. <laughs> yeah, but all the data that I really needed is masked. I can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> or you get a savvy user that's like, "Oh yeah, totally. Here's all the headers." Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll and forward that's you the message as an attachment. You yeah. What? You know how to do that? Right. Wow. Yeah. Right. It's like, whoa, <laughs> what have I found here? Do you want to work yeah. for us? <laughs> Yeah. So the incident master's job is every time there's a role for what happens next, uh, if it's successful, then they continue to like a Dungeons and Dragons, you continue to go on your mission or your journey. Mm -hmm. uh, or if it's a failure role, then to come up with a reason why this wasn't successful and how you'll have to you know, come up with something else, do something different. Yeah. We were uh, playing with, uh, you know, I had a group of people sitting around and I was playing, doing a scenario. And a woman said, well, I have a, a list of procedures if someone gets a bad email. You know, they do this, they do this, they do this, they do this. And I was like, cool. All right, let's get started. Let's go down to the first thing on your list. You rolled a three. She's like. <laughs> and I was like. Your yeah. list of procedures yeah. didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you did not print them out, and the system that they're in is offline. <laughs> right. Can you remember the procedures? Yeah. So it, it was, you know, all of a sudden she's like, what would I do? And I was like, exactly. You know, that's the point of the game. Yeah, the point is to make you think. Yeah. Cool. cool. So, um, I mean, essentially that's backdoors and breaches. Um, right. Pretty rad. Yeah. I think it's a really neat idea. Um, I am sort of curious. I mean, I kind of, I partially know the answer, but the listeners might not. I am, I'm kind of curious as to what led Black Hills Information Security down this road. Like, why are they not just a a usual infosec company who is out there doing pen tests and, and free making socks. money and <laughs> giving away free socks? <laughs> yeah. Um. I don't so know if you have that answer or not. <laughs> well, for one, it's not who I am. Um, like, and it's not who John, our owner, is. Uh, yeah. We just come from these backgrounds of just give it away. Mm -hmm. I, I owned a comic book store for a long time, and I just gave away tons of comics because I wanted people to read comic books. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, one of the things, one of my proudest moments in the comic book industry was I convinced DC Comics to print dollar issues of their best uh, graphic novels so it was the the first issue of a great graphic novel and they printed yeah. it and it was a they sold it for a buck it wow. was cheap to me that i could just give it away yeah and so what i did is i just grabbed all these like thousands of you know comics and i just gave them out to people mm -hmm. and my goal was like hey comics are awesome yeah if, if you had a chance to read this and like you'd probably want to read the rest of it yeah right if you read the first issue or the first episode or if you watch the the pilot of a TV series yeah. right you want to see episode number two or you want to yeah. read book number two you know yeah. it's the reason so many people got hooked on uh, um, Game of Thrones right yeah because <laughs> they wanted to see what happened mm -hmm. next yeah <laughs> uh, and John's background is a teacher so he taught for Sands for 17 years yeah uh, just recently retired. Uh, from teaching for sands um but we just like to teach and we like to give things away so it kind of goes hand in hand that we created a game that just helped people with tabletop exercises because we saw a need for it yeah that's pretty cool i mean that's yeah. that's um that's been my Powerful. philosophy for like ever <laughs> we've talked about it on the show in the past where um you know i, I don't really see a reason to hoard knowledge no 
I no, think I mean, you're, you're only yeah. benefiting each other and, and you never know yeah. if, you know, another person is ever um, at a disadvantage because they don't have access to it. This could be why I'm not a millionaire. I don't know. Well, I mean, that's 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 a more challenging subject. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, one of my favorite things to do at InfoSec conferences is to teach how to speak or how to oh. present. Yeah, I saw your cool. uh, your talk at TurbyCon on that. Yeah. I took a bunch so, of notes and I've applied yeah. them to my blog posts. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's that ripple effect that I may not know information security, but I know how to share knowledge to teach others how to share their knowledge. Right. Um, and so by teaching you how to share your knowledge, I'm actually creating that ripple effect. And that, that gives me a, a purpose and impact. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Because teaching someone how to share knowledge doesn't matter what they're sharing. If they're sharing yeah, it in a correct. way that actually gets out there. That means that sure. whatever yeah. they're sharing is helping people that are in mm -hmm. that that niche. <laughs> and for all the people listening right now, I, like if you get a chance to play this game and, and or you know uh, go to our webcast or blogs or any of the things that we're doing, like our goal is just to make people smarter and better and and to share the knowledge that we have because there's no reason in hoarding it. Um, like you were saying, John, his mom. Uh, his, her, his mom's name was Rita. She passed away a few years ago. But mm -hmm. one thing is that we developed a tool, this network threat hunting tool that our team developed. And uh, his mom was like, John, just do me a, a favor. Just make sure it's always free. I just want it to always be free. Wow. Uh, and so it's named Rita. Yeah. And so, oh, that card's in the deck. I yeah. Really yep. at yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. I, um, I saw his keynote at DerbyCon where he talked about how she went on a pen test with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the one the one that coined the choose wisely uh, phrase that you guys have yeah. uh, have on some of your your swag. Um, I, I got to say it's the only time I've ever cried at DerbyCon. That was a great story. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I mean not you know, story. I, I don't want to say story as though it was made up to make people cry. It was obviously right. <laughs> a very heartfelt thing, impactful yeah. experience. For yeah, me. yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. So, um. I'm curious if, if, and maybe you don't know this, does John like have a background in, in pen and paper games that he decided to go this route or did he just see it as a, as a mechanism? Uh, I think we, you know, talking with John, he saw it as a mechanism. Yeah. Uh, he, he's a former D and D player. Yeah. Uh, he probably bust out and play some D and D now. Like when I see John play back doors and breaches with people, it, it is so like story driven and he's yeah. like so passionate about it. He's rolling the dice and it's just like, he's having the greatest time. Yeah. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Uh, and so like I was watching, I was like, Oh man, I got to be able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, just like I was saying earlier with, with DMS versus players, there are some really good ones out there. Yeah. Um, I've experienced a couple really good ones, and I've experienced a couple not so good ones. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, you can always tell the ones that are really passionate, really love it. So that's cool. That's cool to hear. Quick question for you: um, If uh, somebody wanted to get their hands on this game, you know, if any of the listeners were like, "Hey, I'd, I'd like to either be able to engage somebody with it or get my hands on it," I mean, what are some of the opportunities that are out there, if there are any? So uh, two ways. Uh, right now, um, if you go to backdoorsandbreaches.com, that takes you to a a subsection of uh, Black Hills information security. And then we have information about the game. We have a how to video so you can watch, like, because I didn't really get a chance, or I'm not really going to go into how to play uh, here on this. You know, it's roll the dice, you can play the game, go through scenarios. But John takes you through a couple of scenarios in the backstory in the history of the game. Uh, we have a, um, instructions and things like that on the website. But there's an early requester uh, button. So you can go down there and fill out a form to be an early requester. Um, and the reason why is because right now we don't have them. Uh, we had like two or three thousand of them. Uh, we've already given them all away. Uh, wow. We gave them away for free. With uh, the die too? Or uh, I don't remember what the limitation was on the die. Uh, yeah, money. we give away one die per person. At, at DerbyCon. Okay, cool. Yeah. Is that also going to be included with um, any of the early adopter? Or I shouldn't say early adopter, but term you just used. Yeah, so the early requesters, what's going to happen is we're going to let everyone know where we're going to be at next year. Uh, ah. So we're going to 43 different events next year, including uh, like B-Sides London. We're sending decks to uh, foreign countries, to, to the B-Sides and foreign countries, and they're handing them out to people. Um, awesome. 
Yeah, if you're in information security, we're going to give away, I think we're estimating to give away 8,000 decks next year at 43 different events. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Are they going to have the uh, the uh, uh, same you know issues that the first pack has or the first release, like you said, are, are going to be unique because you guys have resolved all of the uh, spelling errors or anything like that? Are you going to try to revamp it a little bit or is it going to be similar to what people have already have outside of the uh, radical stuff? Uh, we fixed the two typos that we had in the the initial decks from DerbyCon. Okay, so it's basically the same same set, just you know, version two, I guess, or yeah. revision one. There you go. Yeah, and then we added one typo to the second version. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Fix two bugs, make another. Uh, it happens. Yeah. Another yeah. feature. Yeah. Yeah. Makes instead, it of it, instead of it being in an R and an M right next to each other in a in a in a URL. It was Oops. an M and an M. And I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> it's fine. Because it looks the same, right? Sure, okay. sure. sure does. So um, I've included the link to backdoorsandbreaches.com in the show notes. So if anybody's looking okay. to look that up, it'll be in yeah. the show notes for this episode. And then the second way, because um, there's a lot of people that want, they want it without waiting for us to show up to a, a free place next year, or they don't think they're going to be a place that we're going to be at. Yeah. So we're selling them for $10 a deck on Amazon starting uh, late January. Okay. Um, and those are essentially just for the people who can't make it to a, a free event or they get one deck and they want like three more. And we just don't have the ability to give out four decks to one person. So. Yeah, right. Okay. So, I mean, 10 bucks a deck, that's not bad. No. Not at all. I mean, most yeah. most games will uh, will run you, you know, could run you twenty thirty dollars for the initial starter at least. Deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah we, deck, oh, you want the D twenty? That's yeah, five dollars. Right. <laughs> it's gold plated that thing. Yeah. <laughs> we looked at how much it costs to produce a deck, and each deck costs about eight dollars and ninety five cents or so to produce. And, um, and and you can definitely show. I mean, outside of like the case that it's in, I mean, that's nice. That's your standard, you know, fold back. Um, typical for, for any type of playing cards, but even like the card surface themselves, they have that that glide uh, texture yeah. to them, so they're really mm. nicely handled. They're like a decent set of playing cards. They really are. Yeah, so they that, definitely seem like they're going to hold up. That actually brings me to a like non techie non mini related question: What mm -hmm. does it actually take to produce a, a deck? Card. Like, did 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 you just find a card deck printer and make up all your own stuff, or did you just have content you gave to someone and then they made the deck for you? Like, how did that? How does that work? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the so I was over the whole process of getting the decks made. So I can I can tell you about this part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so originally there was a spreadsheet. Uh, so the spreadsheet yeah. said initial compromise and things, and so <clears throat> we're building out the content for it. Uh, yeah. And so all those were you know what words were going to be on the page, how we were going to put it, like typos what, and all. Yeah, all that. Yeah, typos <laughs> and all. Excel has great check. Oh, yeah, there's yeah, like a the thousand way. typos at some point. <laughs> uh, John is amazing at what he does, except uh, grammar. <laughs> yeah, seeing him live okay. edit a slide deck is always fun. Oh, Happens so... every webcast I've seen, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> including the Backdoors and Breaches webcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, you were you were telling us a story about how to produce a deck. <laughs> So there was uh, like going through and doing some iterations of what design looked like and how much uh, space we could fit. So I had a graphic designer. She sat at this exact table uh, and she was you know, proofing out what the cards would look like. We had a person came through and made some of the, the clip art type things for each one of the cards. Yes. So once you have the content that you want to have on each card, then what we did is uh, we had a template. So it took a little while to figure out the template, the size of the font, all that stuff. And then we printed out our own decks uh, using a template uh, that we got from a card company. So we okay. used Shuffle Inc. Shuffled Inc. Uh, they're based out of Florida. And I found this company through ShmooCon. So ShmooCon had produced their own like deck of cards a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I had it. And I was like, I wonder how they made this. So I reached out to the organizer from ShmooCon. And I was like, how'd you make this? And she's like, Shuffled Inc. I was like, oh, cool. Uh, so they helped walk me through the process of getting a, you know, cards made. Um, so we printed our own at the local FedEx. Uh, we hand cut our own. Wow. Like, the first, the first just, uh, beta deck. Yeah. Like Kinkos FedEx? I, I, yeah, I want to call it Kinkos because I'm that old. Um, but yeah, it's just the FedEx office. I'll open oh, it up okay. for you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Kink nope, not going to say it to you. I committed the crime. Yeah. Dustin did it for you. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, essentially, 
like once we started like actually doing some play testing with it, we had sent it to John was teaching. We sent it some of some of the events so he could play with people. Yeah. And then he'd give me feedback and like this card's working, this card isn't working. We need more injects. We need this. We need all those things. How long did that process go on? Uh, that started in June. Um, uh, maybe late Mar- uh, late May, May, June-ish. Uh, and then we got the cards down to the amount that we wanted, the actual cards that we wanted in the, in the deck. And then we printed out a few more beta decks for John to take to Black Hat. Hmm. Uh, so we had a booth at Black Hat, and John just kept playing with anyone that would walk up. Like, hey, you want to play Black Doors and Breaches? <laughs> Anybody that had 10 That's minutes cool. to spare. Yeah. yeah, hey, do you have 10 minutes to learn about? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one other thing that John did is like, as soon as we had the first beta deck, he's like, let's do a webcast. And I was like, John, we've never played this game. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, we'll just figure it out while we're. He's excited. <laughs> yeah, we're live with like 600 people. Yeah. And he's just like learning how to play it for the first time. I was like, this is going well. <laughs> a lot of credit that's that's pretty cool yeah. it, uh, it's pretty interesting you landed on 52 i was actually going to ask is that because that's how many fit in a box <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> the maximum yeah. number is 52 guys yeah. otherwise it's an upcharge six. for the size of the cardboard <laughs> yeah. box <laughs> uh, we could go to a 64 card deck uh but yeah the upcharge was Really? It really was that? Deck. Okay. Yeah. When you said 52, I kind of figured that's what it was because that's the standard size of a playing yeah. deck of playing cards. Yeah. yeah. And then we have the direction card in there and then we have, uh, you know, we have these free, uh, we have Rita. Uh, yeah. Rita. Yeah. Uh, we have ADHD, the two free tools of ours. Um, so, uh, and then like once we figured out that all the cards were right, I did one final play test with the testers. So I got a bunch of the pen testers together and I said, all right, I'm going to go through each one of these cards and you tell me if there's anything wrong with it. Right. Um, and so that was supposed to happen the day before we went to print. I was looking for any little typos. I was like, all right, I need like fresh eyes on it. And about an hour into the session after finding all the typos, uh, the testers go, Jason, this game doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I was like, you're like, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I need more info. Uh, yeah. And you're like, yeah, like none of the cards, like when you read them, they don't go with the other cards. Like it, it doesn't make any sense. And I was like, rut row raggy. Ah, yeah. Someone and just I, like, called your baby ugly. Yeah, like I was <laughs> noticing it too, but I was trying to like, I was in denial. That yeah. I was like, no. No, you guys, you guys are just new to it. Like, you don't understand. Why don't you play yeah. it again? Yeah. And then tell me, no, we've played it three times, Jason. Like, honestly, <laughs> we really think you need to redo this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then what happened was, like, it dawned on me that John had it all in his head. Oh, right. <laughs> so he could play with anybody because he knew exactly. Cause he knows. <laughs> yeah. Because he's comical. filling in the gaps because he created yep. the damn thing. Exactly. It's like so, it's like when you write a book and then you have someone else read it for the first time and they're all like, "What?" <laughs> you're like, "No, it makes sense. That's because you yeah, have all, all this connected. plot in your head." <laughs> and uh, so oh, I was like, "Great." Oh, no, yeah, yeah. crap. <laughs> I, Oops. Because the cards needed to be sent off to the printer the next day in order to have them in time for DerbyCon. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, and so uh, three of the, our pen testers were very kind and spent like the next two hours with me just going through and uh, you, I guess unifying the game itself so that it, it all made sense to anyone who would be playing for the first time. Well, um, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. sounds like an important step. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I spent probably the next 12 hours rewriting every single one of the cards and just making sure that it all followed the same you know, format and then. Uh, I turned them in the next day to the printer and everything was fine. Wow. <laughs> wow. As that saying goes by the skin of your teeth. One of those that's, yeah. that's pulled, pulled an all nighter to get to the printer on time. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Dedication. Uh, and then we got them at DerbyCon and we were hoping people would like them. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you saw the line, uh, but it was oh, Saturday a good morning. Line. Yeah, yeah, I was in that line. Uh, uh, were you with me, Nate, or was I with Jason? I forget. No, I mean, I I, I came up to the booth after I, somebody had already come back with a deck because I was mm. hanging out in, the, in speaker ops with you guys, and someone had already come back with a deck. I'm like, oh, I need one of those, so I walked up and literally I just like walked up to the table, said hi. <laughs> in fact, you <laughs> might have been in the booth. I think you might uh, have given so, me yeah. the deck, 
And then it's like, here's a deck. Okay, cool. And I went back to. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I think you had me a deck too. I was expecting like some type of like. Not not interrogation, but minor like oh well, like so what interests you in this? I was expecting, like <laughs> I was kind of just because you felt so approachable. I was like oh okay, yeah. you know maybe we're gonna talk to you. like here's your deck, enjoy. I was like oh okay, <laughs> cool, yeah. thanks. So let's give it a shot. Don't forget your D twenty, and I think I got either a green or an orange. I, I I think you had two. I don't remember which one I had. Like yeah, I said, I, have, I lost it. I have my orange D twenty in my bag too. It's not lost. It's misplaced. I never lose anything. It's just somewhere. It's I just forget. somewhere that I don't know where it is. It's in the quarantine zone somewhere away from my son. Outside of that, I, I, I don't have a location yet. Yeah. Well, like one of the things that happened while we were at Black Hat. So we're at Black Hat. We're play testing it and everything. And I had told John, I was like, John, I want to give these away to people who teach info, InfoSec. Rad. And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, I want to give 20 decks away to people who teach this. So if you teach information security, you can just contact us and we'll give you 20 decks for free along with dice and everything. And he's like, yeah, sure. Yeah. That sounds great. Awesome. Uh, so we were hoping for like success to us with 75 people yeah. that would ask for these decks. So we had 118 in the first 24 hours. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. I was like, I was like, I was like uh, John, so a thing happened. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> how, how many decks did you print for DerbyCon? Uh, we printed a thousand for DerbyCon. Oh, so you had plenty. Okay. There yeah, wasn't like a shortage yeah. or something. All right. Well, we just finally uh, gave the decks to the educators about three weeks ago. Uh, so okay. we had to print a whole another round just for the educators and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we're at 578 educators now. That wow. Have reached out. That's, you know, are asking for decks of cards for the students. What, what is the demographic? Is that worldwide? Or is that uh, the- it is worldwide. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot in the U.S. The majority is in the U.S. Um but like one of the first ones that came in was a Carnegie Mellon. I was like, wow, oh, that's, that's nice. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's cool. There's there cool. there some branches of the military that teach cybersecurity that they, they were like, hey, we'd like to get some decks too. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, so of all the people you think would have this figured out, the, the military. <laughs> but no, they, they want a deck from Black Hills Information Security. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the response that we've gotten for these um, have exceeded our expectations. So. I think we're sitting at about 3,500 people so far have been early requesters. We have, you know, the 500 and some wow. educators. Um, wow. This That's has awesome. been really, really cool. Talk about success. Yeah. Congrats, guys. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, at one point, I was like, John, I need like somebody to help me with these because I can't keep responding to all the emails. <laughs> <laughs> need an e commerce site. Yeah. So, yeah. That's it's, cool. Uh, yeah, and then I, I would encourage anyone if you have like an idea to make a card game, um, it wasn't that difficult. Uh, it was difficult, but it wasn't that difficult. Right. So if you have an idea for right. I I imagine the really hard part would be coming up with like an actual game mechanic. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, the, I think you see far too often like people going after like the design piece of it, like oh the visuals or yeah. oh you know the graphics or well here's the idea, but they don't really like. I don't know. The really successful hits, the mechanics are always spot on. And like the, the other stuff just comes later. And it's like, okay, that's fine. Like I can deal with typos. Who cares? Right. If the yeah. game yeah. functions well and it's entertaining and I'll pick it up again. Yeah. That's, that's a successful game in my eyes. Yeah. Personally, I had created the game with John, you know, had everything printed and I had no idea how to play. That's like, okay. Right. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. And I was like, and so as I watched John play for the first time, I was like, oh, now it makes sense. Now it makes sense. <laughs> that's, why, <laughs> that's why he did it that way. Oh, the blue cards. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned people can get these from Black Hills at upcoming uh, conferences and whatnot or events that you guys will be at. Can, can you give us an idea of where people can find you? Uh, like- so uh, we'll be at ShmooCon in February. We're going to be at a lot of B-sides throughout next year. We love B-sides. Um, yeah. yeah. If you don't know what B-sides is, if you're a sysadmin in your area, do a search for B-sides. Like if, if you take nothing from this, you know, what I've been saying so far, because you, you have no interest in a tabletop game, find your local B-sides yeah. and just go meet that local security. So community. Jason, the, the co-host who couldn't make it tonight, and Dustin are both on a board for B-sides Delaware. So oh, we're yeah. we're aware of B-Sides <laughs> and our listeners generally are too because we talk about oh, okay. it because B-Sides Delaware what just happened last weekend? Yes, sir. Before. Yep, so, last uh, weekend. so yeah, we uh, 
you know, we talk about it when it's coming and all that stuff. So, awesome. but yes, awesome conferences. I've, I've only been to B-Sides Delaware. I haven't been to any other B-Sides, but that's always Same. a fun conference. Uh, we'll so be anyway. at B-Sides Charm in April. We'll be uh, B-Sides Charm is Baltimore. So we'll be there in April. We'll be at Orlando the week after. Uh, so we're going to be at a lot of different events next year. And, and all you have to do is walk up and ask for a, you know, I'm going to turn up to them, uh, a deck of back <laughs> and breaches. Uh, we will ask you to sign up for our mailing list. Uh, yeah. And that is not to spam you with services because that's not who we are. It's just to invite you to our webcast. And Yeah, it's. I, I will say that you guys are the least spammy mailing list I've ever been joined to. And everything I've gotten from you has been useful. Uh, the hardest part for me is finding the time to get to your webcasts, which everyone I've been to has always been informative. Sometimes they're way over my head, but they're informative. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have a lot of catching up to do. Webcast, podcasts, you name it. I, uh, I'm horrible. With, I like to collect them, but I don't have the I am, time to listen to them. I am literally a month and a half behind on every podcast that I listen to because of the new I, job. I don't even admit how far behind I am. I won't even admit I, it. Yeah. <laughs> I used to listen while I commuted. Well, now I work at home. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm going to go stand outside for an hour. Why are you standing outside? It's freezing. Oh, it's, you know, don't worry about it. I need to listen <laughs> to, to get my, my podcast. Out of the way. It doesn't work when I'm at my desk. <laughs> no. it, it, this is completely derailed, uh, but I work from home too. And one of yeah. the things I had to do is I had to have a mental commute when I started work and uh -huh. a mental commute when I finished. Interesting. And what did that comprise of? Uh, so it's a 10 minute meditation break. Like uh, I will go into a meditation just uh, time prior to work. And so then like right done. before you begin for the day yep. after breakfast or whatever morning rituals you have right before you yep. start. Yeah. Okay. And then at the end of the day, my family knows like he's not done yet until he goes and takes a 10 minute break when work is done. Cause I, I for like seven or eight months, I was working from home and my wife would, you know, I, I love her a lot, but she would like come up and say, hey, what about it? I was like, just like ah. yeah, I was like, I'm not ready to be home yet. Like I'm still at work. So I, I, I can relate to that. I, I don't work remote anymore, but I used to at the prior job and I'm sure Nate can attest to that. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of um, benefits to it, uh, but there's also like a lot of different um, social interactions that are kind of handled differently because you have to have that transition. If you don't have the transition, it's, I don't know can be detrimental you yeah we be, especially if you have a really stressful day we, you're like we did a show of this or an episode of this podcast probably early on one of our probably single digit episodes about working remotely and mm. um i've learned so much since then we should probably revisit it <laughs> sounds good i'm game yeah. so yeah we should definitely go back and talk about that in fact um as part of my onboarding training at red hat they actually had me go through this like um linkedin learning course taught by this guy who teaches you like career advice and whatever is like his shtick but this one was all about working remotely because it, nice. the job i was being hired for was remote and yeah. he said the same thing he's like you need to have something that transitions you from work to home and home to work yeah. just to like transition your brain so it's not the first time i've heard that although if, if i had talked to you two months ago it would have been the first time i heard it so <laughs> <laughs> it's not the, this there's just so many things nobody tells you about yeah. no, no. about having an office at home that yeah. you know are things you need to you need to know Totally. A good chair is worth it, too. Treat yourself to a good chair. Yeah, that's that's kind of next on my list. I have a, a decent chair, but it's it was like, you know, a $100 Walmart chair, not a $500 Aeron chair. It's, it served its purpose. <laughs> it still does, you know. Not yeah. not a super high priority, but it definitely yeah. pays. I will be getting a better chair soon. My, my back will thank me. <laughs> so, um, since we're, we're, we're derailing here... Um, yeah. Obviously, you work for this place called Black Hills. Do you, do you have anything you want to say about Black Hills, about what you guys do or how to, how people can find you or what they might uh, uh, pay you to do? <laughs> sure. We're at uh, blackhillsinformationsecurity.com uh, or at blackhillsinfosec.com. Um, and what we are, we specialize in penetration testing, red teaming, threat hunting. So people hire us to hack them very well. Uh, and then at the end of it, we give them a report of all the ways that we did it. Uh, and John, our owner, did a really good job of hand selecting our testers. And we have testers who have like a, I call it a teacher's heart or teacher's mentality. Mm -hmm. And it's not, hey, I pwned you and look how awesome I am and how bad you suck. And like, it's more of, here's all the ways that I was able to bypass your security. And I'm going to teach you how I did it. And I'm going to teach you why 
you should fix this. And so that's that's it, nice because more often than not, I mean, I, I haven't been through you know an engagement at, at, at the detail of dealing with an engineer, but like I think that's just as powerful as having you know your engineer that's helping implement a new appliance or helping you you know figure out your policies for your department, whatever, whatever level you're at. I think it's great to see it at that level as well because it's not just the person that comes. It's like oh, I know everything. Here you go. It's like oh, hey, this is what we did. I'm really good at my job, and you should really take advice from me because I think this is something that you're going to benefit more from more from more bleh, benefit from more than just having this done and me giving you results. Like let's make this a teachable. And that's great. That's that's really good that you guys uh, try to uh, emphasize that like wholeheartedly. I mean, even yeah. from what you explained with yourself and John, and yeah. now you're talking about the team, it seems like you, as, as an organization, you guys are pretty responsible. It's great. Yeah, yeah, because pen testing can get adversarial really quick. I bet. I bet, especially yeah. especially if the you know if you're working directly with the the defensive team, right? There, mm-hmm. I I can definitely see having been on the defensive side getting almost like offended (laughs) you know what i mean like you walked through my stuff i worked hard on that (laughs) yeah but you did this thing wrong "Ah, you're ugly (laughs) (laughs) uh, we were on a webcast today and we're you know um there are times where within 10 minutes we've owned an organization yeah just we're already at active directory and it's like and you know we don't stop there uh yeah right uh, you know, that's just one avenue. That's one, you know, one, one way that we were able to do it. So let's find all the rest of the ways. And then, you know, how can we teach you? Uh, the red teaming is fun because we show up for a while. And so you, you get to see if you can find us. Uh, and then we do threat hunting. Threat hunting is when you're not sure if you have compromised systems in your network. Yeah. And what we do is we go hunting for compromised systems. And we have a tool called AI Hunter. Mm-hmm. That's a commercial tool, uh, but it's based on Rita. So if you... Uh, if you're listening right now and if you want to do some network threat hunting, see if you have compromised systems in your network, you can download Rita and start using that. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really important thing because I the the number of times I've come across a compromised system, and I, I've I've only done that a handful of times, it's always been like a gut instinct thing. You know, like I know I this is my system, I know it well. It's mm-hmm. not acting like I expect it to. I'm gonna start looking around. Yeah, that's not an easy thing to do programmatically. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it's also not an easy thing to know about every system on your network, right? So yeah, a, 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 a device or a piece of software that helps you identify those things and looks for them when you're asleep or eating dinner or on vacation, um, yeah. and you don't have someone like me. <laughs> That has that gut instinct because yeah. some people don't have it. You know, some people just don't don't have that skill. Um, yeah, um, yeah, valuable what, stuff. What's Anything cool about helpful, it? Right? Uh, go ahead, Dustin. No, go ahead. You're fine. Uh, what's cool about it is it takes a look at the last 24 hours of network traffic, and what it's looking for is beacons, mm-hmm. uh, malware beacons. It's not looking for the actual malware. It's looking for the communication channel. Uh, and so when it detects and finds that, that's when it alerts you to. Can can it. you replay traffic and give it PCAPs to analyze? I mean, yeah. is there ability? Okay, interesting. Yep. Yeah. And I would assume it works with like a modern uh, network security appliances as well, from like a like almost like a tap receiver in a way. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. You put a tap on your network, and then um, you're just uh, you're collecting the 24 hours of data from your seam or your uh, your NetFlow or Zeek or Bro Logs or something. Very good, Zeek versus Bro. <laughs> Uh, and and then mainly, you know, we would encourage anyone uh, just to check out our blogs and webcast because uh, we just like to share our knowledge as much as we possibly can. Yeah, they uh, are. I I can't. I, I know I said it already, but they are valuable webcasts, and I I have enjoyed the ones that I've been in on. Um, you know, sometimes you guys go into stuff that I'm not familiar with. They're mm-hmm. still informative, <laughs> but sometimes they're hard to follow simply because you guys are at a different level. Than uh, than some sysadmins or some, you know, just general viewers are. Um, yeah, we, but I'm sure someone's getting useful data out of it. So <laughs> we did one today on group policies that kill kill chains. Ooh. Um, and it was just here's the group policies that make our lives difficult as pen testers. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. You, um, we were yeah. we were in the midst of deploying Active Directory. Like we we went for a very long time with no Active Directory. We ran LDAP for all of our uh, identity. And we had all um, 
an open source stack. We had Samba and we had, you know, whatever. Um, and then finally they decided, look, we have to get into the, like the Windows admins, the Windows desktop admins are like, listen, if you don't deploy Active Directory, we will, because we want the, <laughs> the management <laughs> tools that come along with it. Yeah. Um, so, and then Black Hills released a webcast almost as though they read my mind, <laughs> almost as though they knew we were about to deploy Active Directory, yeah. all about all the bad things that you need to watch out for in Active Directory. And it was really useful because I showed it to everyone who was on the team that was deploying Active Directory, and they all got useful information out of it, and they all took that back and built it into our new deployment of Active Directory. That's so, really cool. awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's very useful stuff. And yeah. um, like I said, I wish I had time to watch more. <laughs> Yeah, I think the coolest compliment we had recently um, was uh, we were at a conference and the person who was speaking didn't know that we were Black Hills. And he said, um, so we just recently implemented Sysmon in our organization. And we did that because Black Hills said we should. And we just do whatever Black Hills tells us to. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Nice. I guess that's a compliment. (laughs) Yeah. It feels good. I feel, yeah. So, All right, so this has been good. We've gone on for about an hour already when we were shooting for at least half an hour. <laughs> Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank so, you very much for having us on. Did you have any closing thoughts you wanted to get out before this part of the show's over? Um, I would just say, you know, it, if you're new to information security, backdoors and breaches can help teach you at least the terminology that people are using. So as you go through the different attack uh, cards, you can like, oh, I didn't know this is how people pivot and escalate. I didn't know what curb roasting was. I didn't know what this was. I didn't know what you know, multicast poise, protocol poisoning is, you know, things like that. So if you want to learn information security, this would be a great tool for you. If you're an educator and you want to get some decks for yourself, go to backdoorsandbreaches.com and send us a note. Uh, we're on the second wave will be next. There will be a third wave, a fourth wave, and now a fifth wave that we're <laughs> going to send 100 at a time. Um, so it might take us a little while to get to everybody, but we're going to get to everyone. That's that okay. Popular. Nothing wrong with taking your time. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Do, do you have a handle for in case our listeners want to follow you if you're on any socials? Sure. I'm a Banjo Crashland on Twitter. Nice. Um, okay. Banjo Crashland is an anagram of Jason Blanchard. That's where it came from. <laughs> there was a story about this in your talk, but I don't remember yeah. what it was now. <laughs> nice. Nice. You like banjos? I was like, no. It's... Nope. Just an anagram. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I may, I don't know, I may dig up your, your talk from DerbyCon and include it in the show notes if I can go find it on Adrian's website. Um, cause it's, it was, it was good stuff. I, I enjoyed it. I liked it. it was, in fact, I think we talked about it on the show after I came back from DerbyCon and, yeah, cool. uh, we included it then too. Uh, and then, it, uh, my last closing thing was if you're looking for a new, uh, your dream job, I gave a talk at DerbyCon in 2016 on how to hack your way into your dream job. And I highly recommend it. It's been seen like 11,000 times. Uh, nice. Wow. Sent me messages afterwards saying I, I used it and I got the job that I was looking for. And I'm like, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Cool. That's interesting. Yeah. That's rewarding. So, that's awesome. I, Some, I somehow t- I didn't know about it. Or otherwise, I probably would have watched it in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> I took the a penetration testing framework uh, from reconnaissance to you know, uh, pivot oh. and and so I teach how to find a job using that framework. That's um, cool. Interesting. It, yeah, if you have That's OSINT cool. skills, then you can find the hiring managers. Like you can find the <laughs> people who are hiring. Right. Right. Yeah. And then go leave them something on their porch. That might be a little creepy. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know you, but uh, you're about to know me. And here's my <laughs> resume. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes <laughs> I, t- I talk about like how much information is too much information like do you yeah. sit down in the interview and like hey when you go running in your yeah. neighborhood have you ever thought about making a right when you leave yeah. your house have you noticed that your dog limps on just the just its <laughs> rear right leg yeah. what <laughs> you know using like the the shopper card at the store is actually quite beneficial just use the store card i don't know why you don't <laughs> <laughs> what yeah so, yeah, I was just like teaching a room full of hackers, like just use the skills you already have. <laughs> yeah, right, job. right. And I mean, that's that's valid. <laughs> it's definitely valid. Um, social engineering skills are definitely very similar to job hunting skills. <laughs> Absolutely. Like I, I would say I work at my dream job right now is Black Hills. Uh, awesome. 
And so, uh, and John's like, did you do the things in the talk uh, to me? I like, <laughs> no. I... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So, all right. Well, thanks for coming on the show, and thanks for talking thank about you. backdoors yes, and you. breaches. Really cool, uh, uh, instant response tabletop game. Um, I would. I, I. I haven't played through a game. I've seen a couple games played. It looks really interesting. Um, now Definitely I'm not does. in a position where I'm going to be involved in any incident response <laughs> drills. So <laughs> maybe I'll just play it for fun. I don't know. Yeah. Um, cubicles, cubicles, and compromises also sounds neat. If uh, if you if if you have you know someone with that level of imagination, um, again have not played it, but I've seen it played. Yeah. Looks pretty cool. So uh, yeah, thank you and thank you Black Hills for doing the cool things that you do. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank cool. you. Bye. All right, folks. A big thanks to Jason Blanchford for being on the show um, and talking about backdoors and breaches, which is a pretty cool card game for for. Uh, incident response tabletop Indeed. i think it it really changes um just you know the way that you can organize an incident response drill um at least from an infosec perspective I, I i do think it'd be really cool if they'd come up with like a disaster recovery game as well so somebody i get would on be all that. about that get on that make a disaster response that would be fun oh what's your uh, rtos and rpos oh you don't have right, one hmm. right that's <laughs> like we have one for infosec now we need one for disaster response i like um, your thinking so I think we're going to cut out the news for tonight because we went on for an hour uh, with with Jason. Um, not that that's unusual for this show, but uh, I have something going on where I'd, I'd like to get the show closed up and uh, go deal with. So thanks, folks, for tuning in. As always, uh, you can check us thank out. You. Sorry, what's that? I was just saying thank you as well. Oh, okay. I didn't want to talk sorry over to you. you. No, you're good. So, uh, sorry the, I talked over you. The news that we were going to cover, I'm going to leave in the show notes if you guys want to read about it. Uh, there is one in here for uh, anyone who publishes content on YouTube. I don't know if we have any folks that do, but it's kind of a big deal. Um, the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission is cracking down on YouTubers. Not YouTube bom, themselves, bom. but YouTubers about uh, content produced for children. Um, and this has to do with the COPPA, what is it, Ch Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act, which has been around forever, but now it's now it's applying to YouTube content and uh, basically tracking kids, um, you know, based on, you know, what YouTube does, where they try to get your preferred videos based on what you're watching and whatever. Now that applies to YouTubers, and YouTubers can actually be fined if they don't do the right things, and the right things are to declare whether you're content is for kids or not and then youtube will treat that data differently so if you are a youtuber go check it out iron sysadmin podcast is technically a youtuber so we had to deal with this i also have a couple other outlets where i do youtube channels and i had to deal with it with those none of them are for kids luckily uh and luckily. we have a bunch of other articles in here uh, a couple about google getting into some weird areas that they're not already in which might concern people uh, so go ahead and read the read up on those if you want to. If not, whatever. Enjoy backdoors and breaches. It was a pretty cool interview that we just had. Indeed. Um, Thanks for listening, folks. You may have noticed we haven't done live uh, recordings for the past two shows. Uh, that's mainly because the last show we recorded was really hectic, and I didn't want to deal with the complexity. And tonight's show was a super. A similar situation. Uh, we may or may not go back to the live shows. If you guys really miss our live shows, please let us know, and we'll try to make an effort to go back to it. It is kind of a burden uh, to do the live shows, and we don't get a ton of viewers. But if you guys want them, you know, we could we could certainly bring them back. Yeah, um, let us know. Uh, we do. We're still going to release this video on our YouTube channel. YouTube.com iron system, slash Iron System and Podcast uh, if you want to watch basically a recording of the Zoom session where we talked with Jason. Um, so that'll be up around the same time that we post the, the show. Uh, where was I? Oh, Slack. If you want to join our Slack workspace, go to ironsystemin.com forward slash Slack. That will get you to an invite where you can join our Slack workspace. There's a bunch of people in there. We have some pretty cool conversations. Today, we were just talking about uh, password security and password rotation and multi-factor authentication and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so that was a fun little thing. I, I, I enjoy when the community interacts in that way. So that's why we run that thing. 
You can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Both of them are Iron Sysadmin, Facebook.com slash Iron Sysadmin or Twitter.com slash Iron Sysadmin. And, of course, if you would like to help support the show monetarily, you can do so via Patreon. Uh, we still have the same eight or nine patrons that we had uh, last time I did the show, so I'm not going to read through the list again tonight. But a big thank you to you again. Yes, a big thank you to anyone who's willing to give us even, you know, the dollar or two that some some patrons are given. Anything is is helpful. It's paying... Right now, it is paying for the hosting for the show, um, which is something that uh, we have not had income to do until recently. And now we do. So that's awesome. Thank you. Yeehaw. Thank you. And I think that's it. We're going to call it a night for tonight. So thank you for listening and good night. Good night, all.